G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. And in today's video, we're gonna dip back temporarily and talk again about the 2023 draft because some new information has come to light. Uh, a new article on afl.com.au by Cal Toomey has been one of the most interesting reads I've had all year. The, the idea of the article is to cover all the stuff that went on behind the scenes from a trade perspective um, throughout the 2023 draft, particularly the first round, I think uh, the article's focused on. And, uh, you know, I've seen Toomey do this article in previous years, but I don't remember it ever being as revealing as this particular article, whether that's um, a case of him having a little bit more access to knowledge or information, or if it's a case of this year was a genuinely just a big year for live trading, uh, which it did feel like that. We saw the first two top 10 tra picks traded live ever, which I didn't realize at the time. Um, so yeah, this article is really interesting. It's taught me heaps of stuff that I didn't know. Um, and so in this today's video, what we're going to do is we're just going to go through the article together. I don't normally do uh, content specifically like this, and I'm certainly not trying to pass off someone else's work as my own. This is a great article by Cal Toomey. It's worth a read, uh, but we're just going to go through it and react to it together. Before I do, if you don't mind doing me a favor and subscribing to the channel, I really want to hit 25K by the end of the year. Just a little goal I've set myself, um, a little uh, hamster on the wheel at the moment. So is that is that the analogy? But if you're enjoying the content and want more footy and cricket content in general, this is the place to subscribe. So thanks very much. Let's get into it. Great. So the article call is called Inside the Draft, How the Dons Landed Caddy and the Saints Cash In on Pick Scramble. So we'll scroll down and I'll just pick out the parts that are interesting. So the article opens up with, it was the St. Kilda trade decision that likely cost West Coast drafting Dan Curtin last week. Punchy. I like it because we didn't really see a connection before between West Coast and Dan Curtin and St. Kilda. So uh, it goes on to say that GWS obviously had pick seven, which was traded to the Adelaide Crows and became Daniel Curtin. But what we learned from this little paragraph here is that the Giants had multiple offers from five clubs for that one pick. And that is definitely something that was not covered throughout that process. We obviously know Adelaide successfully got it. We know West Coast tried, uh, but we now know that five teams came clamoring for that pick and presumably Daniel Curtin. So uh, here it says one was from the Eagles who were willing to trade that future round, first round pick. We already knew that. The Giants had looked at all options, but decided they wanted to prioritize a drafting Goldart. We obviously knew that too. They proposed a trade with the Saints, where the Giants would have given up pick 16 and a future second to move back to 13. And in this scenario, it would have put the Giants ahead of uh, North Melbourne. So their concern here was that Goldard might go to North Melbourne and St. Kilda specifically. That's who the Giants were concerned would take Goldard. So that's probably why they're willing to trade out of this year's draft. Um, we knew that they probably wanted their two picks, but we were learning that this was because St. Kilda and North Melbourne were lurking. St. Kilda taking Goldard would have been a big surprise, let's be real. Uh, North Melbourne less so because they had so many picks they could afford to maybe take a punt on a, on a small forward. So it would have been a bolter, but... Uh, um, there you go. It was to, they wanted to stay ahead of St Kilda and North Melbourne because St Kilda rejected this trade offer. Uh, that was what ultimately saw West Coast trade offer rejected. So it's interesting how it all connects. If the deal had gone through, the Giants would have then likely accepted the Eagles offer for a top three pick next season, or we're assuming it would be top three. And I think that is a fair assumption. Uh, but the Saints said no to the Giants, conscious that a slide of three spots would risk their access to Darcy Wilson because Adelaide and North Melbourne were interested in their selection. I had previously been aware of a North Melbourne and an Adelaide connection actually to Darcy Wilson. So that makes sense. North wanted some outside class. And uh, yeah, that, that one's uh, not a big shock, but it makes sense. So the article travels back in time a little bit and talks a little bit about Harley Reid. And it kind of just clarifies um, that we we saw you know offers from Hawthorne, North Melbourne, and um, obviously Melbourne as well rejected. And it kind of just explains that as we knew from the media narrative going into the draft, most clubs had just sort of given up on pick one. So there was no actual live trade offers for Harley Reid as far as we, we can tell here. It does actually then say that the Eagles then rated Jed Walter and Daniel Curtin as the next two best prospects uh, behind Harley Reid. So the suggestion that Daniel Curtin was a big uh, favorite of the West Coast Eagles is somewhat validated by that, assuming Toomey's information is right. Then it goes on to talk about North Melbourne uh, wanting to trade up for pick one. And if not pick one, they would have gone for Gold Coast pick five, which obviously uh, that made way to the Western Bulldogs during the trade period, so a little while back. And it, it does say that a deal had been floated between the D's, Roos, and Suns, uh, in which case North would then have two, five, and six in that scenario. The Demons would get pick three, 
which presumably would have got them Zane Dersma, I think, or potentially Nick Watson. I think it'll explain it in a second. The Suns would then get a stack of picks next year, but the Ruse at this point didn't want to jump out of the top three because they were still pursuing pick one. And by the time they'd given up on pick one, uh, the Bulldogs had already acquired uh, the uh, Gold Coast pick, so that makes sense. The Demons then came hard again days before the draft, and they offered pick six and a future first to North Melbourne for pick three. Uh, and then it says, yeah, when Dersma and Nick Watson would have been available. North did its extra work on Curtin late in the piece. So we know that there was, uh, there was uh, news that Alistair Clarkson had met with Dan Curtin in Perth, I think. And obviously that was a little bit of a red herring. There was a bit of suggestion maybe North take him at pick three or pick four as it became. Uh, but this was more so just doing their due diligence. If they had slid down to Melbourne's pick six, then that's who they would have taken at pick six. It would have been Daniel Curtin. But of course, uh, as the article suggests, they decided to hold firm and hold two and three and take McKercher and Dersma. So Melbourne then made the same offer to Hawthorne for their pick. So presumably at this point, uh, they're going for Nick Watson as opposed to Zayn Dersma. Uh, in not accepting the trade, it became clear to rivals that the Hawks had zeroed in on Watson ahead of Curtin and key defender Conor O'Sullivan. So that was the other suggestion that if the Hawks didn't go Watson, they would have looked at a key back, either Curtin or O'Sullivan. In the scenario that they preferred these key backs to Nick Watson, it says the Hawks would have uh, accepted the offer, slid back two spots, landed a free future first roundup from the D's, safe in the knowledge that the Melbourne wanted to take Watson and the Bulldogs were settled on Sanders. So it seems like the Bulldogs as well would have taken Sanders um, if he was available over pretty much anyone else, even if it was Nick Watson. Now on the clock, when Hawthorne is about to select, they say, it says that the Hawks look to see if the offer could be boosted with the Demons Remaining chip being pick 11, but Melbourne wasn't going to give up three first round picks to move up two spots. So the Hawks tried to get six, 11, and a future first to move up to pick five. That is audacious, Hawthorne, but uh, I respect the balls. Oh, that sounded weird. So apparently West Coast also then went for Hawthorne's pick, uh, offering a future first round pick to try and grab Curtin. So not only did they try and trade with GWS, they tried to trade uh, live with Hawthorne as well. But in this scenario, Hawthorne obviously would have traded out of this year's top five. And that's uh, you can see why they wouldn't have, want to have done that. Now, Melbourne had been fans of Caleb Windsor's run and gun for some time. Uh, we knew that that was well documented. Hawthorne having knocked back the last Demons offer called with a future first on the table so they could grab Curtin. So Hawthorne has taken taken Nick Watson. They offered then a future first to the Demons uh, to try and get back to take Connor O'Sullivan or Daniel Curtin. As we know, the Demons held firm and they took their man in Caleb Windsor. So that's where we're now at the GWS pick seven, which did get traded. West Coast offered its future first pick. Uh, Hawthorne offered its future first pick and a future third going back to the Hawks from GWS. Essendon offered its future first round pick with another offer of its top pick and a future second round pick. So Essendon then made two offers. So they're obviously trying to trade up in this scenario. Would they have gone Curtin and then tried to get Caddy later? They might have just gone Caddy in that instance and waited for you know the best player available who then slipped to Essendon. So then obviously the Giants did that trade. It was 8-17 and 17 for 11-15 and 15 and a future second round pick from Adelaide. And uh, obviously that would still guarantee, or virtually guarantee, that the Giants would be able to take Gothard. So the Crows apparently, uh, only days before the draft, sensed that Curtin would still be available for them. So presumably up until that point, uh, they had not actually really contemplated the possibility that they could take Daniel Curtin realistically in this draft. Um, and that's where I think I saw Cal Toomey separately suggest that they probably would have gone Darcy Wilson with their first selection uh, had they kept it. So then it says West Coast did actually try and negotiate with Adelaide. So Adelaide traded for the GWS pick. West Coast then, uh, I think, called Adelaide and said, hey, would you take our future first? Uh, but then obviously the Crows decided they wanted to boost the, their back line with a ready-made key back prospect. Obviously, we Remains to be seen where exactly Daniel Curtin plays. Interestingly here, it says some clubs feel it represented the first step towards clubs being able to trade just drafted players. I find that hard to get my head around. I think what it means is, say, Adelaide's just drafted um, Daniel Curtin. West Coast could, in theory, trade for Daniel Curtin after the fact, hypothetically, in this scenario. I don't see that would ever be the case, and I think it robs the draftees of that moment of, oh, this is where I'm going, that relief, uh, then they get an answer. You know, I don't think it's fair on the players as such if you could trade for recently drafted players, if that makes sense. So then it talks about the Geelong trade with Essendon, uh, where Geelong and Essendon swapped their 10 and 11, uh, but Geelong acquired an extra second round pick. Apparently that happened live, like that, that didn't, wasn't like pre-negotiated or anything like that. Um, that obviously was pick 31 at the time, it became pick 36, and Geelong selected uh, Sean Manor. So they got Sean Manor, a ready-made VFL option, uh, to join Connor Rose Sullivan and Essendon got Nate Caddy. So I think uh, I think Geelong did really well out of that. And obviously Essendon did too, getting their man 
in Nate Caddy. So again, West Coast has come back into the mix. They had a final dip by using its future first round pick to tempt clubs while Caddy was on the board. Also knowing his tight relationship with Reed. So that's interesting. We did see a little bit of a suggestion that the Eagles might be trading live for Nate Caddy. Um, obviously they took Arch Reed with their next selection. So a key forward was obviously somewhat on the shopping list. And uh, that would have been interesting had West Coast been able to secure that. So I don't know who they would have offered that to. Perhaps Geelong. So GWS, obviously, uh, their trading didn't stop there. They got busy again. So they, they obviously wanted James Leak. And that was when we saw them trade a future selection to the Saints to swap spots um, and took Leak, which worked out beautifully for the Saints because the, uh, reportedly they were just going to take Darcy Wilson either way. What I think, though, as the article suggests, is that uh, it wasn't so much about them being worried St. Kilda would take James Leak. They just wanted to beat another club to the to the punch in case somebody else was going to trade for St. Kilda's pick. West Coast also had a crack at trading for Tholstra. That's interesting. So uh, I wonder what we would have offered there. Future first seems a little bit steep for what was pick 13 in the end. Oh, in fact, it says here they put forward a future second rounder and their second rounder this year. So offering two second picks um, for pick 13 is a bit ambitious by West Coast, but uh, interesting that we tried to get Tholstra. Another point here is that Sydney then bid on Rod and Croft and that, that that actually makes sense why they did that because every time you bid on a player and say Rogers and Croft got matched uh, it pushes back the rest of the draft order and that actually means that Sydney can use less points to match a bid for Cleary because he's in theory getting pushed back as well so that's why they're such dicks about uh, bidding on players I guess I, I call them dicks playfully uh, it actually makes sense good job by Sydney Interesting as well, the Giants discussed packaging a future first round selection, the 2024 first, uh, with their next pick to get the Swan selection to get James Leake. Luckily, they didn't do that. St. Kilda uh, rejected that deal, and um, obviously, it worked out well for GWS either way. St. Kilda were also apparently interested in Will Green, the Ruckman who went to Sydney, um, so the Swans didn't want to trade behind St. Kilda. It says the Saints grabbed uh, hard-running Wilson, obviously, ahead of Lance Collard. So that the re the writing there, the, the phrasing of that sort of implies that if Darcy Wilson was gone, Lance Collard would have been their first selection. So you can see a clear example here of a club trade um, drafting for attributes because Wilson and Collard are not dissimilar players. They're both sort of quick forwards who can probably play on a wing. Um, so that makes sense. So it's just interesting that they rank those players uh, as their first and second preference. Toomey says it sets up an interesting alternative draft universe had the Hawks picked uh, Curtin instead of Watson. The order would have likely been Reed to the Eagles, McCurcher and Dersman to North, Curtin to the Hawks, Sanders to the Dogs, and then Watson to the Demons. The Giants would likely have then accepted Melbourne's offer for pick 11 and a future first for pick 7. The Demons would have taken Windsor as well as Nick Watson. Geelong and Essendon would have still been able to secure the players that they did. And then Wilson would have gone to the Crows. So there you go. It validates uh, what I said earlier about uh, Adelaide liking Wilson so much that if Curtin wasn't there, that's who they were going to take. After bidding on Hawthorne's father-son, North then had three of the next four picks, uh, as we know. And sandwiched in between them was previously GWS, but now it was the Adelaide Crows. So that's why they decided to take Taylor Goad, because they knew the Crows would have pounced on him with that selection in between. So uh, obviously they had a... Uh, Objective here to add two tools, best available their last pick, that was Hardiman, and grab the two best available at the start as well. North had also considered shifting that last first rounder back into the 20s for multiple picks, given they had two list spots available. But uh, they decided in real time that Riley Hardiman was too good to pass up. They were interested in Govard, but uh, naturally Govard went at pick 13. Collingwood then took Demetia, as we know, but they had also considered Logan Morris and Archer Reed, so they were looking for talls. Ended up with no talls in this particular draft, but that's uh, that's they decided obviously that Demetia was worth that. West Coast uh, obviously hoping Lance Collard gets through to pick thirty. That's no surprise there. Who's their own NGA player? Carlton took Ashton Moyer, and that uh, beat out Cooper Simpson, Mitch Edwards, and Billy Wilson. So those are the other players that they were considering for that pick. So that's pretty much the uh, the article, guys. I've kind of picked the eyes out of it, but you can go find it on the AFL website um, and you can find, uh, well, it's, it's really interesting insight. I'm glad that they're giving us this uh, exposure into what happens behind the scenes. It doesn't have to be too revealing, uh, but like a lot of tidbits as an Eagles fan, the fact that we tried to trade live for both Caddy and Tholstrop was pretty fascinating to me. And uh, obviously some other deals in there as well. Adelaide taking Darcy Wilson at 10 or 11 or whatever it would have been would have also been really uh, interesting. St Kilda's interest in Will Green, that was new. The fact that five clubs tried to trade for Daniel Curtin was also a very, very interesting situation as well. But uh, I got a lot out of that, so I hope you guys do as well. Um, thanks for watching this video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys.